Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel for today, which will focus on youth perspectives, how a new generation of eco warriors views the past, present, and future of environmentalism, and how we can help shape this future. So before we start with the topic we are going to be addressing today, I would like to um, talk a little bit about this project that we're having this week called Trees and Seas, which is um, a project that, that wants to really bring together marine and forest conservation through different activities. We have activities in 30 locations worldwide, and we will be planting nearly 100,000 trees in this week. We also have over, a, a, over 100 beach for, and forest cleanups, over 30 workshops, film screenings and music performances, and over a dozen panel discussions. I would also like to thank Montes Wines for their support as the presenting partners. And I would like to remind everyone who's here with us today that we will be selecting five people at random for them to win a hardcover edition of the, of the book, Living Without Plastic, which is a new book by Plastic Oceans International and Artisan Book. We will be announcing the winners at the end of the webinar, so stay put to see if you are one of the winners of the book. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat box. We will be reading them and integrating them into the conversation. And if you would like someone else to watch this um, video or if you would like to watch it later, we are streaming it to YouTube and Facebook. So feel free to watch it there as well. So um, now I would like to do a brief introduction to the topic. As many of you who are already here with us today probably know, recently the youth have been at the forefront of the environmental movement and they have been fighting for the right to a clean environment and a healthy future. However, there are many implications to this. Once you choose to become an environmental activist, there's, there are some things you can um, do, for example, or sometimes um, there are many challenges the youth have to face to really be at the forefront of this challenge. However, everyone we have here today, our four excellent panelists, have beat these and many other challenges and, then, and are now at the forefront of the environmental movement. Today, they are here with us to share their experiences and motivate us to increase our awareness and action for the betterment of the environment. So having said this, I would now like to introduce our, our panel members. Um, well, first of all, I am the moderator for, the, for today. I'm part of the team of Plastic Oceans Mexico, where I'm a senior project manager. Um, I've been awarded a Youth Merit Medal of Merit by the government of Mexico City for my record on raising awareness on climate change and motivating the youth to take action to become a part of the solution. Through my work and experience, I have worked with um, the youth across the world, people in many different topics, which has really helped forge um, this ability to cooperate and bring people together to, to implement effective solutions. Our first panelist is Achare Elvis Ayamba, a Cameroonian by nationality, holder of a master's degree in fisheries and aquatic sciences from the Institute of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences of the University of Douala, Cameroon. A passionate and enthusiast early career conservationist, with over four, four years experience in the conservation and marine aquatic ecosystems. Welcome, Ashare. Julieta Martinez, our second panelist, is an 18-year-old student, founder of the Tremendas Collaborative Platform that promotes the empowerment of girls, adolescents, and young people by inviting them to put their skills and talents at the services of the community to generate social impact. Tremendas work has been based on the sustainable development of the UN, and it has seven areas of action environment, inclusion, gender, health, and welfare, culture, science, technology, and education. Our third panelist is Hasik Kati. Hasik is 15 years old and is currently studying grade nine in Indus International School in Pune, India. Hasik is passionate about the oceans and tackling the plastic pollution issue affecting marine life. At the age of 11, he was invited to a TED-Ed talk in New York to talk about his invention, the Irvis ship, which is designed to clean oceans and with a name to solve the plastic crisis we are facing. And finally, we have Yvette, who grew up in Guernsey in the Channel Islands. And while on the island, she pursued an avid interest in the world and the environment through an annual beach cleanups and supporting organization, the Ghost Seas Project. Once on the island, she worked in Ghana for an organization focusing on children who have lost their parents to HIV and lived in rural communities in Nepal after the 2015 earthquake to support building of resilience to environmental disasters. Welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. It's a tremendous honor to have this conversation with, with all of you. And I would love, like to jump right into the questions. So first of all, I would like to ask all of you, 
how you got involved in the environmental movement and what you're currently working on. So we'll start with Julieta. Great, thank you so much for the interest, introduction, Anna. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's doing amazing. And um, so, as Anna said before, when I get into, uh, especially in the world of activism, I started with gender equality. Uh, my my platform, Tremenda, is mainly focused on giving girls voices, have and like basically make them understand that they are political beings. They have a voice, they have a vote, and they have to be part uh, of future changes, like basically part of the of the real changes so to get to a sustainable future. And when we started with the action areas, as Anna said before, we have gender equality, we have uh, health and well-being, we have STEAM area, we have a, an, a climate action. I got super into climate action because of what it was happening in my country. Actually, what is happening in my country? Little by little, little I started to understand there's a lot of environmental issues that are happening are happening super close to me, but I don't um I'm not seeing them. How is it possible that in my same country, not so far away from me, there's more than one million people without access to clean water? We have uh something that we call sacrifice zones here. That is where spaces where people are living um, and they are completely contaminated. It's a really terrible situation that lots of lots of people and communities and families are, are suffering and but actually what, what I wanted to focus on is why does the climate crisis has a woman's face it's something that little by little I started to understand I asked myself why 70 percent of the uh, purest population we, we're talking about women or when we talk about climate refugees we're talking about an 80 percent and not just women we're talking about girls too and I wanted to study the problem and I wanted to find a solution. So I started working with Mendas, but also I co-founded an organization that's called Latinas for Climate that works on how can we make this, we see work on intersectionality, right? Making this connection between girls with climate action, but also with um, Latin America. I think it's one of the most affected regions. And uh, I started working, I started learning, I, and we created, and I, I don't want to take more too much time. So um, what I started doing was an academy. We created an academy called Climaticas that gave more than 600 girls around Latin America uh, access to free education with a, basically a climate education or how we call it. I think it's called climate education, but with a gender perspective, make them understand that if they learn about climate resilience, if they learn about circular economy, if they learn about their sexual and reproductive rights, um, we can create an absolute, a really big impact in our community and make the, the world understand that uh, climate, that basically girls' education is the climate solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julieta. It's really inspiring to hear about the work you're doing and how you got involved. And um, being a fellow Latin American, it's really inspiring to see um, someone so young fighting for the rights of all the youth here in Latin America. Now I would like to hand it over to Hasik to tell us about how he got involved in the environmental movement and what you're currently working on. Uh, thanks, Anna, for the question and um, also the introduction. Um, so my journey started when I was in the fourth grade. Um, uh, I think also Anna touched a bit about this. Um, so I had I was in school one day, and um, they had showed us a documentary about the plastic pollution crisis. And it, it the documentary had a lot of things like how the plastic um, affects the oceans and affects marine life, and just horrifying images of how. Um, marine life like like fishes and birds and uh, sweet creatures die from consuming plastic and um, in being in the first grade it just really touched my heart and I really wanted to do something about this problem so um, one day as I came home from playing soccer uh, my mom told me to wash my hands and um, I noticed how um, in the sink the water actually goes down as a whirlpool so um, this was a bit of an epiphany for me, and I thought how that, like, could we use this concept of a whirlpool to capture the waste um, and store it, maybe like in a mechanism such as a ship, right? Um, so I tested this out in my bathtub with a couple of toys, and sure enough, it worked. So in my school, there was this platform called the Dead Ed Clubs, where we're supposed to um, 
and come up with an idea about a problem close to our hearts. So this is the uh, this is like the best opportunity for me to work on this and actually gain advice from teachers and also fellow peers. So I worked on this for about my entire fourth grade, and um, in the end of the clubs, we were supposed to present it to the club members, and um, and also the club was supposed to send a um, video recording of this to TED Ed headquarters. And about a year later, I was fortunately invited to speak about the plastic waste crisis and my ship at such a huge platform, Dead Ed Weekend in New York. Um, and, and after that, I, um, I was also fortunate enough to be called into various other platforms um, to speak about the plastic waste crisis and my invention. So as I, gave, as I went around the world giving a lot of speeches, I realized one thing that um, like, People, um, while the invention is good, like stopping it, uh, uh, solving the problem in the oceans where it is affected, we also need to solve the people's, like we also need to solve the problem of people dumping in waste in the first place, right? Because if you clean it up and then everyone just tosses at the plastic waste back in this <laughs> much achieved. So um, with that in mind, I really wanted to focus on the youth and um, I co-founded the Ervis Foundation um, dedicated to bringing a generational change in the way the youth of today deals with plastic. Um, so uh, at the Everest Foundation, we um, we have three stages, um, uh, three goals. Uh, so our first um, short-term goal is a um, is to change the uh, mindset of the youth by um, having initiatives such as workshops. Um, for example, the blue workshops where we go to individual schools and then we teach them about the plastic waste crisis um, and not only um, like spread awareness about it, but also encourage them to take it uh, forward and come up with solutions of their own and also like uh, try to create a chain reaction of awareness, right? Um, so that the word actually spreads out and not just limited to them. Uh, we also recently launched the blue circle workshops, which is also getting ready for its second iteration. Um, and that's really exciting. It's a more, it's a smaller workshops, but it, it is spread out over multiple weeks and there's just students discussing about the plastic waste crisis and its various problems. Um, our midterm goals uh, involve a zero waste marketplace where we sell eco-friendly products and as well as an app to calculate plastic debt, uh, plastic debt, which is basically the plastic footprint of an individual. And then the last, like long-term goal is an incubation lab um, of the dream of Air Vista ship, the moonshot project, which started it all. But um, our long-term goal is not just um, limited to Air Vista ship, but more um, towards like incubation of other ideas by youth. So I was also fortunate um, along the way to meet a lot of um, experienced people to be part of my team. Um, I like right now in my, in this call is Priyanka from uh, who works a lot with um, the Airways Foundation. And uh, yeah, so this is just a bit about my journey. Thank you so much, Hasik. I really like this, um, this story you tell because it's so interesting how one thing led to another. You just tried an experiment at home and now you're, um, you're really taking action off of that. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, now I would like to ask Acharya Yamba how you got involved in the environmental movement as well and what you're working. Yeah, thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Thank you, Plastic Oceans, for this great initiative. Also, thank you, Anna. Actually, my name is Achari Elvis. I am um, uh, by profession, I'm a physicist and aquatic science engineer, and uh, founder and uh, executive director of the Environment and Food Foundation. The journey all started in 2012, while we were in the university and we went out for a field trip, visiting the marine and aquatic ecosystem environment in Cameroon. And we went to the mangroves and we went to around the cities and something struck my attention. I saw the high rate of degradation of our mangrove forest ecosystems in Cameroon. And I also saw a lot of plastic pollution. Um, I kept thinking, and it took me some time, how can I also be part of the solution of this threat that I'm seeing in our environment? 
Now it was in 2012 and up to about 2017. That was when the Environment and Food Foundation was founded. And we started together with my friends in school, my colleagues, and we decided to start doing some environmental sensitization and awareness raising in communities. Also, we started visiting some schools around. We visited some primary schools and secondary schools, educating them on the benefits of engaging in environmental conservation. Also, we did a lot of cleanup on a regular basis, cleanups in beaches, landfills, in communities highly polluted with plastic waste, highly polluted with plastic wet bottles, especially plastic bottles. Now, in the context of the Environment and Food Foundation, our main global mission is to, is to work towards the sustainable management and sustainable use of marine and aquatic ecosystems. Notably, we have mangroves, we work on the conservation of mangrove forest ecosystems, we work on the collection of marine litters. We also work on environmental education and awareness raising in schools, in communities. We also work on the conservation of lakes, rivers around the city of Douala, Cameroon. Our Environmental Food Foundation is a nonprofit and it's a startup. At this level, we do a lot of cleanups, we do a lot of environmental education and awareness raising campaign on a regular basis. We visit coastal communities where we see mangroves and the population are highly, are a big threat to a mangrove and try to sensitize them, educating them on the importance of mangroves, on the benefits of conserving our mangroves. Also in the city of Douala, we try to bring together the youth, both male and female, and sensitize them on how we can all put our hands together to clean up our communities. So we do clean up campaigns, clean up events on a regular basis in beaches, in uh, streams and rivers flooded with plastic waste. And I can say it is a major problem over here in Cameroon because of the mentality of the population. The mentality is very poor. So we need to really, we have a great task at hand to see how we can work towards renewing environmental mindfulness of the local population and how they can also be involved for us to see how we can solve this problem. Because the truth is, I believe the local population, the indigenous people are the most important stewards for our environment. We can't do anything without their hands together. We need their support. And that's what we're trying to do now. We're trying to change our mindset so that they can join us, so that together, we can work towards a sustainable world, a sustainable blue planet Earth. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. That's very interesting. And I love how your work really goes hand in hand with what we're doing here um, in Trees and Seas, since you work so closely with mangroves, which are the perfect example of the connection between land and sea, right? <laughs> so now I would like to hand it over to Yvette. Um, so she can tell us a little bit more about how she got involved in the environmental movement and what, she, what she's working on. Hi everyone, thank you Anna. Um, welcome everyone from all over the world. This is really exciting to be here. Um, so a bit about me. Uh, I grew up on a small island called Guernsey, which is um, part of Great Britain in Europe. And growing up there, I was always at the beach. I was kind of, I loved being out in, like especially in the ocean. And as a kid, my parents would always kind of say, but okay, like now I'll go pick up all the rubbish. Um, and I was quite competitive, so we kind of made it into a game, who can pick up the most rubbish. And that kind of sparked an interest in me in terms of, but why is the rubbish there? I always put my rubbish in the bin. Um, and from that, it just kind of got me thinking, I visited with school our landfill, um, and actually Guernsey has a real issue because it's such a small island that um, we have to export our waste now, which then got me thinking, well, where does the waste go? Um, so as a kid, I was kind of always thinking about that, but I also didn't have any education. Um, at school, we learn about how it rains and things like that, but we never learn anything about plastic. Um, and it was kind of like I'd take a plastic water bottle to school, um, but no one would tell me where it went and things like that. So I kind of started asking questions. Um, and then I kind of didn't really get any answers and we didn't have the education systems in Guernsey for that kind of stuff. Um, when I was 16, I decided to travel abroad to Ghana 
and as part of kind of a social movement in terms of um, supporting children who have lost their parents to HIV and AIDS. And it was there that obviously I noticed that there's a lot of plastic in the medical industry and I completely understand that there's plastic in the medical industry. Um, but it wasn't until you kind of left those situations and you walked on the streets that you'd see in Ghana, they have like sachets of water, drinking water. They don't have access to clean drinking water. So there's just these sachets thrown everywhere. There's no waste disposal systems. It goes into the ocean. Um, and there was not really a connection to like why there was dirty water and all this kind of stuff. And um, me with a group of friends, actually, we decided to make volleyball nets out of these plastic sachets. And we were just kind of like, well, how can we make them useful instead of putting them in the ocean or putting them on the side of the street where it's not going to be collected and it's eventually going to end up there. Um, so that just kind of like sparked a, a little bit more into me in terms of like, how can you use the waste and how can you make it and repurpose it? Um, but it obviously wasn't a solution to why was that there? It was a um, kind of reactive decision. And then, um, so I spent a few years like in and out of Ghana whilst I was also studying at school. And then I went on after school to visit Nepal and I was living in a community there just after the 2015 earthquake. Um, and it made me realize that these communities, I, they, there wasn't any plastic pollution there, um, but they were heavily impacted by climate change. And it kind of, so we were there during the monsoon season and the conversations I had with those communities, they were saying that it's getting worse and we don't understand why it's getting worse. And like, we don't understand why we're losing crops. We have like forest fires, we've had like landslides and it wasn't until I had those conversations that I kind of put two and two together and realized that situations that happen in one country don't just impact that country. They impact every country around the world and they specifically impact um, like developing countries. And so I then went on to study at university global development and environmental hazards because I had kind of a, a real interest in the two. And from there, um, I ended up coming to Mexico, which is where I am now. And we, I was working with an organization called Ninth Wave Global. And they work within the community here in Campeche in Mexico um, to support a green community in any way that that means, which is what kind of I really love because there's not any one specific focus. It's all just with the kind of end goal of being environmental and like a community and so that kind of hand in hand supports the local people with um, finding solutions to their plastic waste but also supporting them economically so we run um, for a project called the Mercado Verde where local producers come and they can sell their products um, and they might not they might come with them wrapped in plastic and we don't ever say please like, don't come it's a conversation that we have and we work with them to find those positive solutions to the issues that they face. And um, we also create an amazing community at the same time. And everyone then has the ability to talk to someone about what their struggles, what they want to achieve. Um, and that's also now in terms of an Impressive Verde programme, like a green business programme as well, where local businesses are doing the same kind of thing. Um, and instead of creating competition between each other, it's creating an open conversation um, to support those um, positive actions. So that's me, and thank you, everyone. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. I think um, I think you can really tell how the different experiences you've had by working with people from different places have helped you get a very um, interesting perspective and a worldwide view where you can really tell what you were saying that the problem in one place doesn't only affect that place and. I would like to touch up on that um, a bit further on in the conversation because I think it's super important. But now I would like to ask um, um, all of you what you think the role of the youth in environmental conservation is and what the importance of youth-led action is to promote collective action. Because we all know our, our strength is in everyone acting and in everyone um, speaking up, but what is the role of the youth in making this happen? Achari, we can we start with by you? Yeah. Once more, thank you, Anna, for the privilege. Um, actually, the youth have a very big role to play here when we talk about environmental activism. The youth have, the youth have a very important role. I must confess that I believe in the youth. I believe in the youth because the youth are more energized. 
the energy in the upstream and youths have the capacity to develop innovative ideas. They are very creative, they are very innovative. Now, youths are this like the backbone of many economies, many countries. Youths have these potentials in them. I don't know what to say more because I believe in the youth in a such a way that when they are determined, they produce results. And also more opportunities should be given to the youth locally, nationally, and internationally to see what they can produce. And I believe the youth can produce the result that we are looking for. Youths have always proven in all times that they are capable and they are able to do it. For instance, the context of my country, I see many creative youths around. They do a lot of creative things. They invent a lot of creative things that are not found in any other place in the world. But they have a problem. They lack, they lack finance. They lack exposure to the world. They lack, they lack uh, to avenues where they can advertise themselves so that other people can learn from them. So I think it's high time they give more privilege to youths and they give more opportunities to youths at the local level, at the national level, at the international level. And these youths are the driving force for the sustainable development that we are fighting for today. They are the driving force. If youths are determined, they produce a result. And also the older generation should also help to support the youths, support them by like coming to them in terms of mentorship, in terms of training, in terms of encouragement. But at times, it's, it's quite discouraging to see that the older generation, like the seniors, they don't want to like support the youth. They don't want to like be part of the, the, the solutions the youth are bringing in. Their solutions, they are good, they are fine, but I see that the youth are coming in with better innovative solutions, which we need to give them the opportunity to see what they can produce out of it. Um, I use this opportunity to say, to call on the youth globally that they should believe actually in what they are doing, at, be it at a local level, be it at a national level, be it at an international level. They should believe in themselves and keep going. They should start the change that they want to see and they should keep on moving, moving forward. They should believe in what they are doing. They should believe in the solution they are bringing in for our environmental conservation and they should keep moving. While they are moving, others will see them and follow them. This is just to say the change that we, the youth, we are looking for. This change should start with us. We should be the change that we want to see in our communities. We should be the change we want to see in the world. So we need to start doing what we think is the right thing. And involving in the environmental conservation is something very good, is something very amazing. So they should continue doing what they are doing. They should continue to encourage themselves and believe everything gonna be fine in the future. So without taking much time, thank you very much. Global youths, global dynamic youths, together I think we are going to put, we are going to minimize the threats posed on our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was um that was really inspiring because I really like what you said that we have to do what we think is right and we have to start taking action. Hasik, I would I would love to hear. I'm sure everyone here would love to hear your opinion on the training section about the role of the role of the youth in the environmental movement. So I think that the youth is um, they have a very very important role to play. I mean that's the entire purpose of my foundation, right? Um, uh, the youth again, I think it's it's also like it also boils down to what uh, what Achari said um, that the youth are really energized and they're really eager. Um, so whenever we have a workshops in schools uh, and then we meet the youth, the, they're like super duper energized and they're just, like really um, passionate to do actually try to do something about this problem and try to solve it. Um, and after all, it's really important because we are the people who are going to get this earth, right? Um, there's a saying that we haven't inherited this planet from our um, grandparents rather borrowed it from our grandchildren and that's something that i really quote a lot because it's true right um and eventually the older generation is going to pass down the earth to the younger generation and at this state the earth is <laughs> not in a very good state and i think everyone um and not even just the youth but um each and every generation each and every uh, person on this planet should actively 
try to do something about the uh, about um, about the state of our environment. Um, um, so yeah, I, I know it's a bit of a short answer, but um, no, it's perfect. I think um, you went straight to the point, and you made some really really interesting remarks. So thank you so much. Um, Yvette, Yvette, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, so I mean, of course, I completely agree with what the other panelists have already said. Um, for me, I also think that it's time for the youth to start questioning the systems that we've already been put in. Um, we've been put into thinking uh, one way is best, and that's the economy. And we've kind of been put into these capitalist structures, and people buy into that, and people uh, kind of just go along with that. And I think that it's now like the youth's turn to question why is that the main goal of life? Like, why is it to make money? Why should we have to make money? Like, that's the kind of things that have been put in place for us to come and live in. And um, for me, I think it's now time for the youth to kind of break down those barriers that have been put up for certain people in certain places and to uh, like to talk about it, to open up those conversations and to critically analyze it. Um, because if we don't if we just kind of say okay yes there's climate change um but why is there climate change why have these things happened and how can we positively impact the future um so i think that it's of course it's um unfortunately developing nations that bear the brunt of climate change impacts and it's also uh yeah as um Julieta said in like women as well it's certain people are put into um community and social injustices and it's now time for us to kind of talk about why that is and how we can support people in those situations and how we can better the world um, and I think that that is where the youth can come into it and start questioning what we're what, what's told to us what's taught to us at school and um, like the Irvis Foundation is doing in terms of teaching and education and I think everyone here is participating in educating the youth which is incredible and I think that um, giving uh, people the tool to um, say that maybe actually I don't agree with that, I don't want to be put into that bracket, I don't want to be put into that system and understand that we can change those systems as well as long as we kind of come together as a youth um, collective and um, talk about it like we are now today. Um, so yeah. Thank you Yvette, I completely agree. It's, um, I think younger, young generations of the past have kind of maybe, well, some of them, not to generalize, but have more followed what, what they were taught before. And this um, generation has really been um, characterized by asking themselves and asking the system why we have to do this, why um, some things are a certain way, in order to really find better ways to do everything, right? Um, Julieta, I would like to now hand it over to you to see um, if you would like to add anything else. Thank you so much, Hannah. And I completely agree with all the other panelists Actually, what I was thinking when you talked about what's the role of youth, is especially in conservation. Every time I think about conservation, I think about something that we want to protect, something that we love that we want to protect. We want to protect our biodiversity. We want to protect our endemic species. We want to take action, right? And every time I think about taking action, I think that's where youth takes place. I want to tell you a little story, and it's really the promise. Uh, a couple of months ago, I made me a Twitter account. I thought it was already time to get into the world of Twitter. And I was amazed how much angry people I could find there. Lots of angry per persons talking about, oh, I hate what the government's doing, I hate what the state is doing, or I hate what this person in particular is doing. And I was wondering all that time is, so how can we change that? It's, it's really okay to criticize things and we need to have a critic um maybe, maybe the, the that mindful like um no no it's not mindful but basically it's really important to criticize things to actually take action or make a difference right make a different uh make a positive impact so where's the other step how can we pass from the speech to real action to create that positive impact in our communities and i think that's where you take place I think right now, where, when we talk about system, I was really inter interested in what, what Yvette was saying about we have to think or question how are we, our systems working and how can we improve them or maybe change everything to actually make something better and change for the better, of course. Um, but also when we talk about take, take action is when how can we actually make every single voice um, 
well, how can we make that a, a system where every single voice is heard and every single voice takes take it actually is being uh, represented in decision making? And uh, I think when what the role of youth right now is, uh, like before getting to the role of youth, we want to. I think it's really important to think about what we need right now. Where are the tools? Where are the mechanisms to actually get um, our projects to, to to succeed? Right to get our objectives. Because I I work with lots of people from my age. Now I I'm 18, but a couple of days ago I was 17, and I work with girls normally girls from that have 10 years old, 12 years old, 11 years old or 14, or maybe my age is 17, 18. And one thing that even if they're super different, everything, even if they have super different stories, our maybe the, the thing that normally, uh, like the, the same problem that happens over and over again, is that somebody tells them that they are like uh, a not important part in civil society, because they still are minors, so they don't, they can have the right to vote yet, so they don't, don't have a voice in everything. And when we connect with girls, especially, um, I still have comments like when, when I'm talking about the climate crisis and when I talk about different things that are happening, especially in Chile, I get action, uh, questions like, but do you want to have kids? Do you want to be a mother? Oh, um, do you have time to get a boyfriend while you're doing everything, you know, when we talk about climate activism? So I think it's really important to spot that things. It's really important to understand that right now youth Sometimes don't, uh, it's not that we won't, don't want to act. Sometimes we don't have the mechanisms or we don't have the space to actually raise our voices. When we talk about the youth of rule of youth, I think we have to talk about an intergenerational dialogue. I think that's the key. I'm not talking about telling adults, oh, this is all your fault. Now we're, we're like this because of you, but change our, our speech and saying we have a problem, but we have the tools to, to change. But you know, you have to take me into account because everything that's going to happen in our planet, our generation is going to be the most affected by it. And we are going to be the ones that will have to basically stop that. So, yeah, I think that's the rule, rule of youth in, in environmental activism. <laughs> Definitely. And I think um, what you're saying is so important. And um, what you say, what you say of the youth, some of them are not having um, the right mechanisms to be able to act. It's so important that we raise our voices and that we really help them find these mechanisms that could um, help them act. Right? I have this uh, friend who participated in this uh, forum with uh, high-level govern um, government people in Mexico, and she would tell them, like, "I'm supposed to be in school, you know, like I'm missing school for this, and I'm." not going to be able to do my homework because I have to be here and talk about this. It's so important, right? Um, and now I know both um, Iveta and Julieta are, sorry, the phone is okay. Both Iveta and Julieta are involved in environmental justice and climate justice, right? So I would now like to make a question specifically for you two um, and about how we can include intersectionality in activism and how does environmentalism relate to social justice? Um, I, Yvette, would you would like to start? It'd be great. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so I guess like the idea of like intersectionality is that um, it's the awareness that people can be like discriminated against in a whole range of factors, and um, like we've already touched on the fact that like, women, their voices aren't necessarily heard as much, um, and young people especially as well, because like uh, Julieta said, we can't vote. Well younger people can't vote. Um, and that's kind of putting people into certain areas. And again, so for example, if we go back to like indigenous communities and things like that, they they lived with the land. They, they don't live on the land and own the land. They respect it and they, the flora and the fauna is like their livelihoods. And so they live in a subsistence way. Um, and I think that obviously over time, the commodification of like land and water and basic like human things that we need to survive um, became about money and about who can make the most money and who, and then that divides and separates people in so many different ways. And I think that to be, um, about the environment, it's about also the people that are in the environment. So everyone, 
And I don't think that we can seclude, like put someone else and say, actually, no, this doesn't include you. I think that everyone needs to be involved in the discussion. And it is where um, women and like the gender oppression systems here in the world um, have pushed women into these like boundaries of the people that cook, the clean, that have children, things like that. And they aren't able to go and have those conversations with people and they're not allowed to go and um, have their voices heard. And it's the same with young people. And I think that um, for it to be like, for the environment to really um, be sustained and be able to, for future generations, um, every voice needs to be heard and every person from every country um, needs to be um, listened to. It's a real shame that obviously people in developing um, countries, they get their voices heard less. And that's something that like, I've, kind of, I've witnessed and I've seen it and it's a really horrible system of oppression. And I think that in order for those people who are impacted the most um, to be heard and to be um, understood, but it's also um, one thing that I like, obviously with Nightwave Babel, um, we almost kind of go by undevelopment. So when I studied development at school, it was about like, okay, how can these people make money and how can we develop them in that way? And that's obviously a white um, Western way of thinking. And actually um, Ninth Wave focuses on like, obviously the local people are the experts and no one else knows better than the people that are there and that working with those people to understand like what's happening in that area instead of just going and saying okay we're going to do this this and this um and listening to those people and the communities and um their opinions their concerns and things like that that is where sustained change is going to happen because if someone's listened to and someone feels like their voice is being heard they'll take ownership and they'll understand like they'll um, make those changes themselves it doesn't need to be forced upon them anyone and I think that um, yeah allowing for those platforms is where sustained change is really going to happen and people will like be proud of where they live and what they're doing yeah I, I completely agree it's so important to really think um, about to think locally right and to really um, realize that there's people who have a lot of knowledge of how things work in their community and the solutions that um, have been implemented and everything, and so important to create this dialogue. Julieta, would you also like to answer this regarding environmental justice? Of course, and I would like to focus on social justice in particular. I think uh, that it's really important to understand, to, to start when, when we talk about intersectionality, when we talk about intergenerational dialogue, with all this kind of stuff, I think it's really important to understand that when we talk about the climate crisis, we're talking about the social, crisis too. They are not problems that are working like super separate. They are all in the same agenda. They all have uh, points. Um, they are really connected. That's what I want to meant. That's what I meant. Um, and I want I want to go straight to point, but I, I think I really need to say this because I really want to make this this one thing clear. Um, so a couple of years ago, I was reading a post that one of the guy, one guy that is running for president here posted and it was a letter for a 13 year old girl that I'm gonna, I don't want to say her name here, her name here, but is a 13 year old girl. But basically, what the letter said is Hi, my name is, mm, I'm 13 years old, and I needed to ask you a favor. Right now, I'm living in a sacrifice zone where I can go to school because the air is so contaminated that I can breathe. I can't breathe. And I haven't, I, I can go to school and it's already three months without going. And I really miss my classmates and I really miss my teachers and I really want to educate myself, but I don't have internet. So I'm, I don't know what to do. But also when you read the Finnish part of the letter, the, what the girl said is, I know that right now my, my, my space is really contaminated, but please don't close, the, please don't take down the companies because my parents don't, don't have a job. So please don't do it. So that's when you find out that this is just not the climate crisis. We're not talking about environmental issues. We're also talking about a social crisis and what, and has, uh, and, and, and taking the, the Yvette, Yvette point. When we talk about this crisis, we're talking about where uh, most vulnerable people 
normally those are, are being invisibilized and marginalized and they don't have a voice in decision making they don't uh, have a space to actually raise their voice and make an impact for the community so i think every time i think about intersectionality and think about what is the line that separates separates uh, discrimination with violence when we talk about youth for example and we talk about, for example, uh, public, pu public policies, we talk about law projects, for example, and we talk about we want to make a new initiative to help all youth about this problem in particular. But I think what we want to question ourselves is, this is actually going to help every single young, young person in my country? It's going to help young per people from the north of my country, the center of my country, the south? What if they are in, uh, they're part of an indigenous community? or oh, they are a part of a migrant community, or they are women and they are girls, or they are living in rural areas. These are these, all these little details that are not little. They make a difference because they are people that are living uh, the, 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 like every single problem that are affecting them, affecting them. They are trying to search for solutions totally, and normally it's, it's really different because they have different tools, they have different mechanisms and uh, they normally react different. I think it's it's really important to take into, into that into account. And we and, and the other um, basically we understand that, that intersectional is super valuable. It's super important, and we have every single voice represented in decision making. We can create a. It's not just uh, like we we call it solutions partitive. It's like like um, superficial solutions. We're talking about. Um, like really, a uh, really a systemic impact in in our society. I think that's I think that could maybe to take the moment to, to take it. I forgot the word English, but I think you got my point. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, that was that was really really interesting, and I completely agree. When thinking of solutions, we really have to think outside of the people we usually work with, and we really have to take into account those who live in the north, in the south, in the center, um, to really make sure that the solutions we propose work for everyone. Um, now I would like to ask um, Achare and Fatik. We got a really interesting question here. Um, so it says, let me read it for you. Um, from Ali Akbar said, my question is how these young environmental activists feel over the, the response they have received from the respective societies. Do they think that they have been able to make a big difference? And how has their activism been received by the, their youngsters, le political leaders, policymakers, et cetera? So, um, Achare, would you like to answer that first? This the question again. The question. Please. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, of course. So basically, they're asking um, what perception you've gotten from your activism, from social leaders, political leaders, and if you think um, the response has been adequate, and if you've been able to do enough um, with the response. <sighs> Thank you very much for that question. Firstly, I must say, in the context of my country in particular, Cameroon, the voices of the youth is not heard. They are, they are voices of the youth is not being heard by political leaders in particular. And it's a very big problem right now because some of the decisions taken at the level of the parliament, senator, is, uh, is imposing on the youth actually is not supposed to be so and the ideas and the, the contributions of the youth doesn't reach at that level which is not was not supposed to be so so it makes it very difficult at the moment for the activism that we are trying to do to get at the level of the political Authorities. It's a big challenge, but we think things will be things will change with time. And at this level, I can confess that we work at the local level with the local population mostly, and we wish to go at the level of the uh, the parliament and the political leaders. But for now, we are still at the level of the local population. And going at the level of the parliament and the political leaders is, is, is a gradual process and it takes some time. So it's a matter of time. But at this level, at a local level, the, 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 the consciousness is coming up. The consciousness is being revived at the level of the local population. 
and gradually we are going up to see how we can also meet the, the political leaders, also the, even the social leaders. So I think it's a matter of time and it's a gradual process. I think I don't know whether I've answered the question correctly. No, definitely. That was very, very interesting. Thank you so much. And Hatik, would you like to add anything else? Yeah, so um, I think that young, uh, young environmental activists, uh, they are getting quite a bit of um, like positive responses. Uh, and that's really good because the, these positive responses can really help motivate us to do uh, what we're we doing, right? But the thing is, uh, our our one drop, like one piece, uh, something that people, a lot of people, keep on iterating is that, um, but you are too young to do anything, right? Uh, you like you need more experience, and I think that's what really um, handicaps people from actually um, supporting the youth. That uh, the youth are not experienced enough to actually try to do something about the uh, about uh, the social issues and the environmental uh, problems and to that i say um i mean uh, experience is good but the thing is we we all need to work on this we are all in it um to, uh, in this together whether you like it or not um and and we need to start to, to work on this as soon as possible and age is not it's not a barrier um it's not a barrier to progress. Anyone and everyone of all of all ages and diversity should um, try to do something about um, about about the environmental issues. And um, and I, and, I, and I say this to all the youth out that don't get um, don't get held back and don't get affected to what other people say um, and don't get held back on negative responses. I think you should really try to keep moving forward and try to be determined. Determination is key to, um, and, and just follow, um, uh, follow your passion to try to do something about this, about this problem. And, um, and ask for if they've made a difference, of course, they, everyone has the potential to do a difference. Like changes change, whether it is refusing a plastic straw or, or if it's, I don't know, doing something like doing a large scale project and and don't and and again to all the youth out there, don't be discouraged by the fact if you've not done um, um like not done something big like setting up a foundation. It's a it's a step by step process, right? It's it's a journey that we all have to take and um and and, and yeah, we will all get to some um we we'll all get to some place like uh, regardless of whether how like whether how quickly we'll get there, so um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Hasik. That, that I really liked what you said. That um, it, it step by step is really important, right? You don't have to change your life drastically from one moment to the next. And if you're if you don't establish a foundation and change everything in your life, it doesn't mean that you're not doing anything. You know, little changes really do make a difference. And one of the most important differences they make is that they motivate others to really make those differences as well, right? So thank you so much for um, bringing that up. I think it's really important to talk about it. Um, so for the couple of last minutes, I would like to touch on this last um, question. To end on a more positive and hopeful note, I would like to ask you all what you think the future of this movement is and what your vision or dream for it is, right? What you would like to achieve through your work. We, we can start with Julieta. Yes, of course. And to make it double, uh, there was a question in chat that it's super connected to this question in particular. So that I can make like a mix because there was a girl called Jimena that I was asking, like, how can I talk with all the generations, right? Like can I, every time I talk about this, maybe they find me extremist because um, they think that it's way too much or it, it's way too hard, maybe. So um, I always, when we talk, I always, when I talk about climate activism and everything that young people are are doing, it amazes me. And I think it's, I, I have a, a wonderful, uh, right now in Tremendas, I have the wonderful job of, uh, like I have to check profiles of girls that want to join the, the platform. And I have to say, like, like if I can say it from, from my summit, I, it, that's a health, something that we could say in Chile. I'm pretty sure that you, it's not something that you say in English too, but um, it's amazing. 
it's amazing to see how young people are really interested and basically not just young people but how young set is really interested in making a change but because they're not thinking just about their generation or there as an individual they're talking thinking about future generations too and i think it's, it's something that we really have to to take into account um on the other side of the coin of course things don't don't look that way that that good has taken pretty sure that he mentioned it that of course, we don't have the. We're not in state in the great state right now. And we, when we think about the climate crisis, I have uh, I know a lot of people that talk about maybe climate anxiety, right? The feeling that it's a problem that is super close to me, but at the same time, I don't know how to act or how, I don't know how to make a change to actually um, uh, make a difference, right? Make an impact. So, what could I say from that is that. Yes, we, we can actually make an impact. I think uh, the world right now, when we think about the con the context that our, we are living on, we're going through a pandemic. We're going to through a crisis. When we, I think about Latin America, Latin America, I also think about social crisis, for example, and of course the climate crisis. But also, I think that there's something that's really interesting and something that it's in everyone's mouth right now is that we're talking about redesigning the new world. When we think about redesigning, we, we think about rethinking. And when I, I think about rethinking, we're talking about rethink our policies, rethink our economy, rethink our practices, but also who are the leaders that I want to follow? And I think that's what we, we need to think when we think about future. Who are the leaders we want to follow and what values they have that he, he or she or they share with me? Um, I think it's really, really important to think, uh, take into account that the leaders have to have uh, the climate crisis as a priority. They have to talk, talk about intersection with intersectionality as a priority. They, they have to talk about intergenerational dialogues as a priority. And um, I think that's the world role, not just just uh, like as youth, right? We're talking about um, social uh, civil society. That I know that sometimes people. Uh, say like oh uh, even if i i try i'm not gonna make a change maybe maybe you alone make won't make a change but if you work based on community if you work together with our people that have the same um maybe the same the same uh fights as you i'm completely 100 percent sure that you will make a change that right now we have it's amazing to have social media to have the opportunity to, right now to be talking to you working or using my ipad it's it's just it's mind blowing, and I think we we need to take advantage of that, especially for the people that right now doesn't have the opportunity, and we don't have we can't be the voices for we can't talk for them. We have to be the way. Of, basically, we have to work so they can have an actual voice, an actual representation on decision making. Thank you, Julieta. That was great. I completely agree. Um, Hasik, would you like to add anything? So I think, uh, the, I think, yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, so I think the future of this movement is definitely the shift from dialogue to action, because I think the while awareness is good and all, and like, uh, we can't just keep on sitting here and talking about this problem, just speaking about it without any action, right? Um, we need to uh, think, we need to act now and act fast. So, um, like there, there are a lot of climate clocks and they, uh, most of them forecast that we have about six years to solve uh, the climate um, the climate problem. And, oh boy, <laughs> six years. Um, and I think, and we, we really need to, uh, we really need to act now and we need to really uh, transform um, some, something that Yvette really um, emphasized on, uh, transform the systems that are in place and really, um, Question everything, <laughs> uh, and start um, and start acting on it. Everyone of every diversity and ev everyone in this earth. Again, we are we are all in it together, and we need to really start working on it. And so, that's the, my final message. Thank you, Hasik. I completely agree. Um, that transition from words to action is really what we need right now. Um, Achare, would you like to add anything? Yes, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I like the word for my brother over there. It's time for action, actually, it's time for action. Yeah, 
There's a lot of talking, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of words that action, I think, stand for it, action, sustainable action. Um, I think the future is good. The future is good. We have a bright future for environment and we just need to be more focused. We just need to keep on doing the good works we are doing at all levels. And it's also, there's also a need of collaboration, uh, international collaboration from one activist from other countries coming together, sharing ideas, sharing their experience, inspire others. So we really need to work hand in gloves. We really need to put our hands together to put this to an end. The problem is there, it's visible. Everybody sees the problem around us. Plastic pollution is everywhere along the globe, around the world, and it's time for action. We see deforestation of our environment everywhere. It's time for action. So let's just put the hands together. Let's share to see how we can come. And every single human being, as far as you're living, it concerns everyone living on the planet Earth because everybody takes the breath of oxygen and it comes from this environment. So everybody's concerned here at all levels, everybody's concerned. So everyone has a role to play. It's either you join an organization working to conserve this environment or you support what they are doing financially, materially, or any other way you think you can support. And mean it must be a way you can also support to see that we put our hands together in order to conserve our environment. So together, I think we are gonna make something good. And we cannot say we solve the problem totally, but we can contribute to the solution. And we need to raise other environmental warriors, environmental ambassadors who will take the lead because we are also very soon, we're also going to get older. We need to continue to raise younger generation that will continue the good work we have all started. So thank you. There's hope for the future. Let's just be focused and continue doing the good work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Achari. I like what you said. There's hope for the future, right? Um, we can't uh, let the feelings of um, everything that's happening and how we feel very helpless or um, powerless, let's not let that distract us from the fact that there is hope. And finally, Yvette, would you like to um, add anything else? Yeah, so I mean, I, I was quite amazed that we managed to go through all of this without mentioning the pandemic until quite recently. Um, obviously, yeah, we are going through a really horrible kind of time. And I think that the pandemic has shown us how connected we all are by the fact that things happen everywhere and that everyone was impacted by this pandemic, but also how disconnected we are and how we didn't really realize that there were so many things happening. This has kind of finally given us the opportunity to sit down and, for example, like the Black Lives Matter movement, the feminist movement that's happening in Latin America, all those things had space to come about and actually be put on social media. And there's been a few questions about social media and things like that. And that even though we've been confined to the walls of our houses for so long now, we've been able to sit down and slow down and really kind of research and find out about global issues and things that connect everyone um, and things that are happening all over the world. Um, I guess like my, my kind of aspirations is the fact that we've had like almost a hundred people sign on to this like um, Zoom thing and I have no idea how many people are live and things, but I think that everyone that's taken even just this hour today to listen to us and we're only five people. Um, there are so many people out there that are trying to do things and that there is hope and there are so many ways that we can do those. And I know that it does seem really overwhelming and that there's so many things to be done and so many ways to do it. And I guess like going back to my point that we live in such imperfect systems, you can choose to eat an organic a vegetable that's been flown from halfway across the world or eat something that's been grown in pesticides right next to you. What decision do you make? There's so many ways and eco-anxiety is such a big thing now. Um, but I think as like as I said, like we just need to do our best and we need to try in every way we possibly can. Find local people that want to have these conversations with you and surround yourself with people that make it seem like a little bit less of a challenge and I, I for sure feel like it's a little bit less of a challenge after this conversation today with all these incredible young people and all the people that are um, participating in these questions and things like that I think that there is hope and that we can 
do it and I guess like how do we turn words to action I guess my one thing to everyone that's here today would be like maybe just make one change like refuse a plastic water bottle you can do something we don't need hundreds of people doing zero waste chemical free lives perfectly we need everyone here today to just start that conversation and to slowly seep it into our communities and it will it will get there it's i have hope now and thank you everyone for joining us i think it's been an inspirational moment for me <laughs> thank you Yvette. i completely agree it has been a very inspiration um inspirational moment for me as well and that way you were saying about con conscious decision making is so important right um it's something that we can implement right now just thinking about every decision you make and the impact that decision will have can make such a big difference so I uh, thank you so much to all the panelists. We have Yvette Griffiths from Ninth Wave Mexico, Julieta Martinez from Tremendas, Chile, Acharya Yamba from Environment Food Foundation, and we have Hasik Kasi for, from the Ervis Foundation. Thank you also to everyone who was here with us today. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and thank you for such great comments and questions that you have been putting in the chat. And I would just like to remind you that we will be sharing the book winners in just a minute. And I would like to thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Montes Wine, a Chilean brand with products available in over 100 countries worldwide. And we are also we also have our sponsors, Avocado Green Mattress, One Tree Planted, and EcoWatch, our global media partner. Thank you so much. And now for the book winners, um, we have Alexis Alim, Elisa Abraham, Yun Yu, Suleiman Kane, and Yvonne Tien. Thank you so much. And finally, we do have a panel tomorrow um, focused on creativity as the voice of for the planet at the same time as the one today. So we do encourage you to sign up for that as well. Thank you so, so much.